On August 27, 1645, the small town of Bury St. Edmunds, England, set a grisly record. That day, 18 men and women were hanged together as witches. It was the single biggest mass execution for witchcraft in English history, and it was all the work of one man. Matthew Hopkins was many things a tavern owner, a former lawyer, a dedicated Puritan. But to the people of Bury St. Edmunds, he had only one title worth knowing. And that was Witchfinder General. The son of a minister, Hopkins began plying his gruesome trade in 1645 at the height of the First English Civil War. Together with his associate John Stern, he was personally responsible for the torture and execution of more women than every single English witchfinder in the previous century. But Hopkins's tale is more than just a catalogue of atrocity. It's a tale of what can happen when an entire nation succumbs to fear and mass hysteria. Today we're going to examine how one zealous man managed to corrupt England's soul. When Matthew Hopkins was born in Wenham, Suffolk, probably in 1620, it was into a world that was alive with superstition. A king was on the throne, King James I, who didn't just believe in witches, but had literally written the book on them called Demonology. Britain's fastest growing religious movement, Puritanism, took it for granted that Satan himself walked the byways and the country lanes of England. For Hopkins, this meant a childhood that was practically drowning in superstition. His father, John, was a Puritan minister who preached fire and brimstone, as was his uncle and one of his brothers. It's likely they even had a copy of demonology lying around the house. We say likely here because there's a lot we actually don't know about Matthew Hopkins' early life. While centuries of legends claim that he did this or that, the historical record is actually pretty sparse. Take his education. There's some evidence that he may have gone to Holland to finish his schooling, just as there's some evidence he may have trained as a lawyer. But we're going to be honest with you and simply say that we just don't know. Maybe all of that is true, but maybe none of it is. What is true is that his father passed away at some point, likely around 1635. Come 1640, Matthew moved 10 miles down the road to Manningtree in Essex. Local law has it that he purchased the Thorn Inn in nearby Mistley, but really, that's just another guess. But it's here that the guesswork finally ends. We know that Hopkins was in Manningtree by the end of 1640. We also know that he was around 19 or 20 years old. And that's important because 1640 was the year that the peaceful England of Hopkins's youth finally fractured into a billion jagged pieces. It was time for the First English Civil War. If you've watched our video on Oliver Cromwell and modesty aside, it does make a useful crib sheet for this entire period, you'll know that 1640 ended with a Scottish army occupying the north of England and King Charles I being forced to call a new parliament to raise taxes. Okay, now the ins and outs of this don't really matter for today's story, but the upshot is that this led to something called the Long Parliament, which led to something called the Grand Remonstrance, which in 1642 led to Charles deciding to crush parliament in a war. And look, I know we're really missing out a lot of stuff here. Don't have too much of a go at me in the comments. This is really just a super condensed timeline in order to give you just some background information. Now, the war was really hard on England, as civil wars tend to be. Local courts were suspended in many regions, and law and order it kind of broke down. In place of all this came famine, fuel shortages, and biting poverty. Places like the east of England, where Hopkins lived, were particularly hard hit. Much of the east was staunchly Puritan and pro-Parliament, which was a huge problem when nearby Oxford was the base of the king's anti-Puritan army. To use a crude analogy, living in Essex during the dark days of the war would have been like living in Poland shortly after Hitler annexed Czechoslovakia. You know the hammer is going to fall, you just don't know when, and that waiting could send men mad. Men like Sir Harbottle Grimston. Back in 1640, the livestock on Sir Grimston's vast estate, an estate that included Hopkins's new home, had begun to be plagued by mysterious illnesses. As the ongoing war worsened the situation, the local peasantry turned to superstition in order to explain things. Before long, they were certain that it had to be the work of a witch. And in 1645, they finally identified her. Elizabeth Clark was an elderly widow living on Sir Grimston's lands. That March, a lynch mob of villagers presented her to Sir Grimston as the source of all his woes. Like the good Christian he was, Sir Grimston recommended Elizabeth Clark for trial. 
All right, so at this point, we do need to take a quick leap back in time because I want to give you some background information on witch trials in England because A, it's super interesting, and B, because it will help you understand how terrifyingly unique Hopkins was. Prior to the era we're talking about, witch hunting hadn't really been a thing in England. In the medieval period, witches were actually seen as healers and pillars of their communities. It wasn't until 1563, under Elizabeth I, that the bill against conjuration and witchcraft and sorcery and enchantments made witchcraft illegal. Even then, it was barely illegal. The first major witch trial in 1566 found all three defendants guilty and sentenced them to just a single year in prison. That's right, no torture, no burning at the stake, just 12 months months in the nick. Now, we need to be clear that English women were executed for witchcraft in this period. Unlike on the continent, though, their deaths were closer to lynchings. Local magistrates would get caught up in a panic and sign a death warrant only to be later punished by their superiors for being credulous fools. Executions weren't government policy unless the witch was using her supposed powers to commit other capital crimes like murder. Now, that all changed when James I ascended to the throne. On March the 24th, 1603, Elizabeth I breathed her last in the chilly rooms of Richmond Palace. Barely was she cold before her successor, James I, was ramming anti-witch legislation through Parliament. James I was obsessed with witchcraft. In 1589, he'd been on a boat that nearly sank in a storm that was blamed on witches, and the experience sent him just a little cuckoo. In 1597, he published Demonology, the witch-finding book that James Hopkins had kept lying around Matthew's childhood home. In 1604, James I turns this personal obsession into legal reality. Parliament passed the Witchcraft Statute, which made the very act of using witchcraft rather than the spell's effects a capital offense. If that sounds like splitting hairs, the results suggest otherwise. Eight years after the bill passed, ten women were hanged in Pendle for witchcraft. Four years later, another nine were sent to the gallows in Leicester. By the time you get to Elizabeth Clark's trial in 1645, witch trials had become a fact of life in England. The only remarkable thing about them was how comparatively restrained they were. Remember, this was the era of the Würzburg witch trials when up to 600 witches were burned alive in Germany. Against such mass slaughter, nine or ten being hanged was pretty mild. Unfortunately, though, things wouldn't be mild for much longer. Back in Mannington, 1645, Matthew Hopkins had gotten wind of Clark's impending trial. For whatever reason, something about this news lit a fire in his soul that burned like the fires of hell. Despite having no training and no legal standing, Hopkins decided it was his duty to get involved with Clark's prosecution. It was a decision that would very soon lead to the bloodiest witch panic in English history. In his 1647 book, The Discovery of Witches, Matthew Hopkins would claim his witch hunting career began in 1644. However, all evidence suggests that it was here, with Elizabeth Clark in March of 1645, that he really got into witch finding. No one is sure of the exact timeline, but it seems that Hopkins was approached by a man ten years his senior named John Stern, originally from Lowe's in Suffolk. How exactly they got talking is unknown, but it soon transpired that Stern shared Hopkins's sharply defined view of good and evil. Together, they agreed to make Clark confess to her sins. At this point in English history, torture it was illegal. To elicit a confession, suspected witches would be monitored by watchers to see if they summoned any familiars or started zooming around on broomsticks or something like that. Clark had been watched for several days now, and so far nothing had happened. That was until Hopkins and Stern showed up. Despite having no legal authority to do so, Hopkins and Stern convinced the watchers to turn Clark's interrogation over to them. They took her to the Thorn Inn, and what happened next is shrouded in mystery. Hopkins would later claim that they witnessed Clark call her familiars, imps in the animal form, to the inn, including a demonic bunny rabbit named Sugar, and no, we're not making this up. <laughs> More likely, Hopkins and Stern, they tortured the poor old woman. Either way, the result was the same. Clark confessed to being a witch, and she started naming other witches as well. Armed with these new names, Stern and Hopkins approached the Earl of Hardwick, who was presiding over Clark's trial. Impressed by the young men's initiative, Hardwick gave Stern an official warrant to find more witches in Mannington. Hopkins, he was made his assistant. It wouldn't be long before their roles were reversed, though. Over the next few weeks, Hopkins and Stern conducted their inquiries. The five women named by Clark were all taken in and interrogated until they too confessed and gave up more names. Within no time at all, the witch finders had jailed 23 women, and Mannington was in the grip of a full-blown witch panic. Puritan writer Nehemiah Wallington recorded the whole thing, including the lurid testimony of Rebecca West, who'd been jailed by Hopkins alongside her mother Anne. West claimed that she'd been forced 
forced to have sex with the devil, and that only a mother's death could save her from Satan's spell. The jury obliged by having Anne hanged. By the end of the Essex trials, 18 women had been hanged, including Elizabeth Clark. Further, four more had died in jail. Only Rebecca West, who'd sacrificed her own mother, was finally set free. It was the deadliest witch panic to have ever hit England. Even if Hopkins and Stern had never tried another witch, the Essex trials would still be famous. Buoyed by his success in Manningtree, perhaps enjoying the newfound celebrity, Hopkins bestowed upon himself the title of Witchfind General. Armed with Hardwick's warrant, he and Stern headed east, following in the wake of the shocking news of Clark's execution. It was this news that became the spark that would turn the east of England into an inferno. In December 1643, the Provost Marshal of the Parliamentarian Eastern Association commissioned William Dowsing to destroy all non-Puritan icons in Suffolk. Dowsing took to the job like an extremist duck to water. Way into 1645, he rampaged across the East, burning churches, vandalizing icons, and encouraging Puritan extremism. Eventually, Dowsing's zealotry got so frightening that Oliver Cromwell personally stripped him of his commission. By then, the damage it was done. Dozens of towns across Suffolk had been reduced to wrecks, their populations either cowed or swept up in religious fervor. It was these people who, two years later, would call upon the witch finder general. As they left behind the dead of Manningtree and ventured into Suffolk in 1645, Hopkins and Stern charted a course that took them to many of the towns Dowsing had previously swept through. It's a move straight from the modern extremist playbook. Identify a person or community already damaged by extremism, like dousing smashing of icons, and push them even further into madness. Just as ISIS did on the war-torn plains of Iraq, Hopkins and Stern soon found an audience in Dowsing's ruined villages. The pair's modus operandi, it was simple. As they traveled, the witchfinders would let villagers know that they were in the area. The villagers responded by inviting them in. Yep, they really did invite them. Like a pair of misogynistic vampires, Hopkins and Stern never entered a victim's home without an invite. In normal times, this would have ensured their crackpot adventure ended as soon as it had begun. But, well, these were not normal times. People were afraid. Afraid that the king's army would kill them, that their children would starve, and that they would freeze to death in the winter. In another historical context, that fear might have been turned on Jews or illegal immigrants or any other outsider group. In England of 1645, it was turned on women. Once invited into a village, Hopkins and Stern set to work on suspected witches. Unlike the thumbscrew-happy sadists in Europe, Hopkins' interrogation methods wouldn't have looked out of place in a CIA handbook. Victims were made to sit absolutely still without sleep for days on end. Others were locked in isolation and denied food or anything but water. Yet others were made to exercise for hours and hours every day until they were ready to drop. At the end of all this psychological torture, the accused they nearly always confessed. Hopkins then forced them to name more witches in the village who would in turn confess, and so on and so forth. That's not to say that the stories you've heard about Hopkins aren't true. He really did test if some women were witches by tying them up and throwing them into rivers. Those that drowned, they were innocent, and those that floated had magic powers, and they were executed. For all this bloodshed, Hopkins and Stern earned anywhere between £6 and £23 per village. At the high end, that's roughly equivalent to £5,000 or $6,500 today. It's said that Hopkins made £1,000 during his career as a witchfinder at a time when the average laborer's wage was a mere sixpence per day. Death, in short, it made Matthew Hopkins filthy rich. Not that he and Stern actually hung around for the death part. Their confession elicited the witchfinder general and his assistant would vanish into the night, leaving the accused to their fates. And what fates these were. In August of 1645, an 80-year-old minister called John Lowes was forced to run on the spot without sleep until he collapsed from exhaustion. On the 27th of that month, 18 women and men were hanged together outside Bury St. Edmunds, the worst mass execution of any English witch scare. And yet, that's right, men were killed as witches too. Hopkins was responsible for the execution of between 17 and 20 men for witchcraft during his career, including three husbands who were killed alongside their wives. But let's not kid ourselves. Gender was an important factor in determining if you survived a meeting with Matthew Hopkins. In that same space of time when he killed 20 men, Hopkins sent an estimated 200 women to the gallows. 
In September of 1645, the Witchfinder General committed his most notorious act. As the Dark Knight drew in, Hopkins and Stern arrived in Ipswich. There, they tried and convicted Mary Lakeland. In a shocking break with tradition, rather than hanging her, they decided to burn her alive. As the black smoke coiled into the sky over Rushmere Heath, Hopkins pocketed his fee and left. Perhaps he heard Mary Lakeland's screams and felt sorry for her, but perhaps they made him feel good. This was the foulest day in the history of English witch hunting. Thankfully, it would also be one of the last. So here's something you might not have expected. During this whole gynocide thing, Hopkins and Stern hadn't exactly been hiding from the authorities. The BBC has reported that Hopkins may have been paid for his work by official government sources. Whether that's true or not, there's no denying the Witchfinder General soon came to the attention of Parliament. Back in August of 1945, Hopkins's conviction of John Lowes, that old guy that he forced to run up and down until he collapsed, had resulted in a witch panic in Bury St Edmunds that eventually saw a hundred people jailed. Had Hopkins had his way, all 100 of them would have been executed, but word of the gigantic witch trial it leaked to Parliament. It was simply too big to be credible, so Parliament sent their own people out to retry everyone convicted by Hopkins. This time, the trials would be more careful, they would be less tainted by bias. Which is why on August 27th, only 18 witches were hanged at Bury St Edmunds rather than the 100 that Hopkins had hoped for. Of course, hanging 18 people for made-up magic is still deranged, but here's the thing. Parliament's witch hunters were a model of sanity compared to Hopkins and Stern. In light of the near miss at Bury St Edmunds, many MPs began to wonder if Hopkins was actually a bigger danger than the witches that he was finding. It helps that by fall of 1645, the conditions that had allowed mass hysteria to flourish, they were on the wane. The Battle of Naseby in June that year had seen the remaining royalist forces mostly crushed. The war was now winding down, and with it, the famine, hunger, and fear that had driven the witch panics was as well. As 1646 dawns, the tide of public opinion had decisively turned against the witch finders. The Puritan minister, John Gall, published a pamphlet that attacked Hopkins in no uncertain terms for the slaughter that he was inflicting on the countryside. Gaul was someone who actually believed in witches, but even he could see that the Witchfinder General was out of control. Hopkins tried to fight back. He wrote Gaul a chilling note threatening to come look for witches in his area if Gaul ever criticized him again. He and Stern they stepped up their visits to villages, but the game it was already up. On April the 27th, 1646, Charles I was forced to flee Oxford after it fell to parliamentary forces. Although the king would escape being taken into custody for some weeks, the First English Civil War it was over. Not long after, Parliament summoned Hopkins and Stern, accusing them of the illegal use of torture. Hopkins was now famous, but not as a savior of the Puritan faith, rather as a likely charlatan who'd sent countless women to their deaths. By August 1646, Hopkins' credibility with the public it was shot. Villagers no longer sought him out. The powerful no longer defended his work. Possibly scared Parliament might try him in turn, the witchfinder general discarded his phony title and retired back to Manningtree. His entire witch hunting career it had lasted less than 18 months. Still, Hopkins had his blood money, and he was respected by some of the most zealous Puritans. Thanks to his reputation, he was able to publish his book, The Discovery of Witches, in 1647. When the first editions reached New England, they sparked off a series of witch panics that would culminate in the infamous 1692 Salem Witch Trials. Not that Hopkins would live to see the last grisly fulfillment of his legacy. In August of 1647, at the age of just 26 or 27, Matthew Hopkins keeled over in Manningtree and died. While legend says that he was tried as a witch using his own methods and executed, the mundane reality appears to be that tuberculosis carried him off. Yet, even as Hopkins died, the world he helped create was already fading. By the end of 1648, the vast majority of English women accused of witchcraft were being acquitted. Even when the Second and Third English Civil Wars blew up, followed by Oliver Cromwell's Puritan dictatorship, nothing like the witch panics of 1645 took hold again. Forty years later, in March of 1684, Alicia Mollins became the last person to be put to death for witchcraft in English history. There would be more trials, including an infamous one in 1717, but never again would they result in a verdict of execution. Now let's flash forward to 1735, a full 90 years after Matthew Hopkins's ghoulish spectre last roamed the English countryside. The great Robert Walpole was the Prime Minister, and the superstitions of the 17th century had given way to the scientific curiosity of the 18th. 
Elizabeth. That year, Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act. It repealed all previous witch laws and all punishments for witchcraft. Instead, it penalized pretending to be a witch for profit or to influence others. Think about that for a second. Within living memory, Matthew Hopkins had slaughtered more than 200 women for being witches. Now the law stated that such a thing was impossible, that witchcraft was nothing more than a pretense. A humbug. We like to think that that news sent Matthew Hopkins rolling in his grave. Finally, on June 13, 1782, Swiss executioners dragged Anna Goldie out to a field and lopped off her head. The blood that pattered down onto the grass would be the last blood that would ever be spilled in Europe's witch hunts. Over the previous three centuries, over 200,000 women had perished at the hands of the continent's inquisitors. 300 years of misogynistic murder had finally come to an end. But the story it doesn't quite stop there. In 1921, gardeners were doing some work on a house in the village of St. Osith in Essex when they found a pair of female skeletons. Dating from the era of the English witch trials, the two unknown women had iron rivets driven through their joints to stop them rising from the grave. It was a chilling, visceral reminder of Hopkins and his methods transported forward to the 20th century. Even now, traces of his superstitious worldview still linger over the countryside in local hills and forgotten heaths named for the tortures that he inflicted there or the helpless women who died under them. Hopkins may be gone, but his legacy lives on. The next time you hear spooky tales of witch trials or maybe see someone dressed as a witch for Halloween, remember to spare a thought for all of the women who died at the hands of England's Witchfinder General. So, I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. And if you're looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out one of our other videos linked to on the screen now. I've also got another channel, Top 10s. Find that linked in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.